Hey guys, it is December of 2025, and that means it is once again time for the annual celebration of dos -sember. This time of year, YouTubers in the retro community put together videos on MS-DOS, and, well, consider this my contribution thereto. So I have two computers on the bench today. We've got a 386DX40 with 8 megs of memory. And down here on the floor, I have a 486DX33 with 16 megs. The 386 is running DOS 5, and the 486 has DOS 622. And I'm going to connect these two computers, as you might have in the early 1990s, using a program called LapLink. It was a way to transfer information from one computer to another, using either serial or parallel. So let's take a look at the back of these two computers. On the right, we have the 386. And on the left is the 486. I can use a serial null modem cable to go from COM1 on the 386 to COM1 on the 486. That'll give us a maximum theoretical transfer speed of 115,200 bits per second. It doesn't have to be COM1, of course. I just chose COM1 in this case, since I don't have anything connected to that port. But more commonly, you would have used a parallel connection, going from LPT1 or LPT2 on one computer to LPT1 or LPT2 on the other. Being a parallel connection, you would get considerably better throughput. Now unfortunately, I don't have that type of parallel cable, so I'm actually going to use a serial connection here. We'll take a closer look at the cable later on, but for now, let's deal with the software end of things. So I'm going to start on the 386. Once again, this is running DOS 5. And I have a copy of the LapLink software, it's version 5.0. Okay, we'll give the computer a name, 386DX40. And no, we don't have anything connected to the parallel port. If I had a printer or a scanner as an example, that would definitely get in the way. We'd have to use something like LPT2. Now, if I were running Windows, I would probably have a serial mouse attached to COM1, and I strongly suspect that would present an issue. But I'm doing this all in straight DOS mode, so I can get away with using COM1. In practice, you'd probably be using COM2. And that's it. Installation is complete. We'll take a look at the interface in a moment or two. But first, since this is basically a peer-to-peer -peer connection, we need to install the software on the 486 as well. So let's switch over to that system, and I'll execute the installer. On the 386, I specified a username Scott. On this computer, we're going to use Annika. Now, of course, we're going to call this computer 486DX33. Once again, there's nothing connected to the parallel port, and I'm not going to be using Windows on this computer. This is a pure DOS operation. And once that software is installed, we'll shut down both computers and connect the cable. Speaking of which, let's grab a multimeter and we'll take a look at that cable. Specifically, what I have here is a serial null modem cable. It's similar in concept to a crossover cable. The transmit pin on one side is connected to the receive pin on the other, and vice versa. So for this 9-pin version of the cable, we have pin 2 on one side connected to pin 3 on the other. So the meter is set to continuity mode. I'm going to check the connection from pin 2 to pin 3. So that should be a good serial null modem cable. Okay, so that's the cable we're going to use today. 
but I've got a couple other cables. Let's grab another one and I'll test that as well. So just like with the previous cable, I'm checking from pin 2 on one end to pin 3 on the other. But with this one, we don't seem to have a connection. This would appear to be a serial straight through cable. They look the same, but the pinout is different. So that means this cable is not going to be usable for this purpose. So now that we know we have a good cable, I've hooked up COM1 on one computer to COM1 on the other, and I'm booted back into DOS. The computers do indeed see each other. If you look under Choose a Connection on the 386, I can now see the 486DX33, and it's connected on COM1. And now let's check our port settings. Yep, that's set to automatically negotiate the speed. And of course, if we had a parallel cable, this is where we'd select that option. So under Connections, I'm going to select the 486DX33. And the software is going to tell me that the clocks are out of sync on these two computers. Now that's kind of a big deal. If we're going to maintain the proper timestamp on all the files that we copy, we need to get those clocks back in sync. Otherwise, the software could overwrite newer files, thinking they're an older version. So both clocks are now synced to the local time. Let's find something on the 486 that we can copy over. There's a directory on here with a video memory test utility. I'm just going to copy that directory from the 486 to the 386. Now this is actually copying in real time. I haven't sped up the footage. It's copying approximately 718 kilobytes. The transfer took 45 seconds. So we've got a transfer rate of approximately 16K per second. That's 16 kilobytes. So it's not super fast, although it's certainly fast enough. If you had a bunch of files that were too large to fit on a floppy, I can see this being a viable solution back in the day. If I were transferring a large amount of data, I really would want to get that proper laplink parallel cable. Now I do have a couple of parallel cables, but unfortunately not exactly the right pinout. I've ordered a couple of those parallel port breakout boards, and I'm going to wire something together, and we'll see what kind of difference it makes. Now I should note that later versions of DOS, starting with 6.0, came with a similar program called InterServe. But of course, one of these computers is running DOS 5, so that's really not an option here. Part of the reason I did it this way, I actually encountered exactly this situation. It was about 30 years ago, and we needed to copy some files from a 386 running DOS 5, to a 486, I think it was a 486DX25, and only one of those two computers had a network card. So it was either Laplink or a pile of floppies. So if you enjoyed this one, feel free to like and subscribe. Drop a comment down below. Did any of you actually use Laplink back in the day? Or for that matter, are any of you using Laplink now? And, as always, thanks for watching.